I'm going to today talk about artificial intelligence, but really what I want to talk about is the fact that artificial intelligence is a double-edged sword. We often spend so much time getting excited about new technologies, but it's important for us to understand that since the beginning of time, when we have always encountered new technologies, we've had to deal with the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'm going to kind of talk through two particular things that people in businesses and governments really worry about. One of them is fake data. Now, we have heard about fake data because we know that it had a huge influence on the US elections through fake news. And this continually is proliferating in the world. Very recently, an artificial intelligence machine can exactly create a fake UN speech in under 13 hours. So if you were to read the speech, and the UN uh, is gathered to talk about climate change right now, you would really believe that it was actually written by the UN Secretary General or someone else. It would be able to copy it so well. But let's say you said no. You're not going to buy that. You're too smart for that. Instead, what if you heard it? Now, there is software out there that you could download on your phone, and you could just record my voice for 3.7 seconds. And after that, you could recreate my voice, my Pakistani, American, Singaporean accent, and you could call my mother-in-law, you could call my clients, you could call my husband, and it would be very difficult for them to know that it was not me. But you could go further than that. You could say that, no, we don't believe that either. Well, this actually happened. Just a few weeks ago, the vice president of a company over the weekend received a call from his boss who basically told him to move $243,000 to pay a merchant in Eastern Europe. And of course, it sounded like him. He had all the details. So he went ahead and authorized it. Two hours later, the boss called again. And this time, he got a bit suspicious. He didn't understand. Maybe the boss had been kidnapped or something. But in fact, what had happened on investigation was that the boss had never called at all. There was an AI that was completely simulating through fake voice the voice, intonation, and content of the particular uh, president of the company. So this is very real. Scams happen all the day, all the while, and this is very much the new kind of financial crime that we're seeing. Now, where does this fake data come from? It seems terrible, but what was the roots of it? Well, the root of it was that when you work in artificial intelligence, 90% of the companies you work with complain that they don't have enough data. And it's true. Even those who don't, don't always have the right data. And so it's very hard for AI to be accurate as a result. So new academic research came up that started to look at generating fake data. And this fake data was then created for things like solving the question of whether somebody had breast cancer or not. Same algorithm now is being used to actually look at MRI images and detect five years earlier in academic research whether a woman is going to have breast cancer or not. And the same data algorithms are being used to generate that fake voice and fake videos and fake news. And in fact, anything that happens for good, unfortunately, can turn bad as well. Fake data can actually be created out of your cancer MRIs and give the wrong information to insurance companies as well. 
This is the dilemma. We must acknowledge it. We must grapple with it. We must govern it properly. We must find a balance. And the wrong question is this knee-jerk reaction, this emotional debate on whether we should keep developing AI algorithms or not. The right question is, how do we govern it? How do we amplify all the potential and the good and we reduce the negative externalities? Before I talk more about governance, I want to talk about the second use case, which is on personal data. Again, um, we give personal data all the time to companies. And we here are kind of the elite. We use it for conveniences, for Facebook, for Google. But there are other people in the world that give their data for other reasons more serious reasons, the unbanked in the world. Did you know that out of 612 million adults in South Asia, only 58% of them have access to formal or semi-formal banking? That means you can't buy anything with a credit card. You can't pay for health insurance. You can't buy a house. And this is overall, across the world, a huge problem. People are now using data to understand the risk of these individuals so that they can lend them money. For example, there's a company called Tala in Silicon Valley, and there are many others like that. It immediately approves a loan from $5 to $500 USD within 10 minutes to someone who has no financial history by assessing their credit risk by looking at their phone. And it looks at about 100 different characteristics of how they use their phone. What are they browsing? Where are they going? What is their battery life? Are they on roaming or not? How are they filling out certain forms on the internet? If there is somebody in Kenya who wants a student loan to study for accounting and is it at a waiter, is a waiter at a particular restaurant, then if you look at what he's doing during that time, is he walking and serving or is he being at the back, not doing anything? What is he browsing on the internet? What kind of apps is he downloading? All of this gives you information. And there's more. There's women like this one. She is a woman in the middle of Karachi with over 20 million people. And she wanted to open a beauty salon. She's a housewife. Who would give her a loan? No, banks certainly wouldn't. She doesn't have an education. She can't pay for anything. But one company has information on her, and that's the telco called Telenor that has an e-wallet and allows people to pay for things like groceries and even pay their utility bills through the phone by topping up on their points. And as a result of this, they know that she pays her bills on time, that she has a regular routine, what she buys, and they're able to create a credit profile of her using these alternate data points. And they give her the loan. Now here's my question. At what cost are they taking her data? It's a poor woman. She has another shot at something. But they're taking her data. And what are they doing with it? They're assessing the data to give her alone. This is a dilemma. It's very easy in the developed world for us to not understand that data oils the wheels of credit and capital in the unbanked world. There is no easy answer to this. 
And there's this whole idea of the fact that you have to triangulate the data, even if it's anonymous, is it really anonymous or not? Well, I think that the right way to think about this is governance. It's not an emotional debate, but it's about governance. There are certain use cases where it is good and useful to use data. Security, for example, in smart cities, you have security, you have CCTV cameras everywhere. I was in New York when September 11th happened. I remember after that how the city put CCTV cameras everywhere, and we felt more secure. But there has to be a way not to take it to an extreme so that tomorrow your data is being sold or that tomorrow you are being punished for giving your trust to the government or an, or an organization. So there are some ways of doing this. One of them is differential privacy systems. There are statistical algorithms that one can use that actually may add white noise to the data so that even if I take all the data from a group, I'm unable to backward engineer to a particular person. There's also homomorphic encryption, which is also a way to actually protect data. This is about security. The easier, earlier one was more about privacy. But it ends up leading to the same conclusion, which allows machine learning algorithms to operate on data without decrypting it. These are essential, and these are processes, laws, technologies that can be used to put in protection for the very customers who we are trying to serve. And then, of course, there's the question of bias. All the data that we put into a particular algorithm actually influences the output that we get from it. We know that in Amazon, they had an AI tool. And in that AI recruiting tool, they said, this is a job. Now please go out and find the best people for this job. And lo and behold, the AI tool repeatedly found only men to be suitable for the job. Now, somebody noticed this, some woman noticed this, because as we women know, men are not necessarily always the best for the job when compared to women. But the fact was that it was mimicking the habits and the preferences of the HR director. So the AI algorithm copies all the historical habits and mimics them. And when it started mimicking it, it started choosing men over women. This is very important to realize, that the data that you put in can actually heavily bias something against the interests of minorities, but also against the interests of the company itself. But is this always the case? Is AI always biased? No. It's not. In fact, in the US, it's been discovered that it is less biased than human beings. Again, I'm pointing out to you both sides of the story every time. Because when I go to conferences, there's either the rah rah AI bandwagon, or there's the oh my god, I'm freaking out, this is so bad uh, bandwagon. And I do this every day. My team and I. We are a team of machine learning specialists and data engineers and AI scientists. We go in, we see at the source what happens. And so it is all about how you use a particular algorithm and how you use the data going in that actually determines whether it is biased or not. And in case you don't know, well, guess what? There are certain statistical ways to understand and estimate if something is biased or not. For example, using these, you can tell if a particular minority is being discriminated against. 
My co-founder's PhD is actually in bias and is used by the judicial system of the Netherlands. And part of what he tried to do was come up with a module like this, which he did, that determines and lets you know if the AI is biased. Here's a very important point. All of you may not be techies or data scientists like me, but you need to know this. Because somebody's going to come to you and tell you something, and if you are not aware that there are ways to reduce bias, increase privacy, and also increase security, then you're just going to buy whatever people are telling you. And worse than that, you may actually think the machine is smarter than it is. And part of my big mission is to let everyone know that this is our responsibility, collective responsibility, to pay attention to the good and the bad side of artificial intelligence. So how does governance work in practice? I already pointed out to you that there are lots of ways you can do it, one of which is to actually undertake different technical and statistical methods. Another way is to be, have a sense of how something works. When I started off on Wall Street um, ages ago in New York, I was a traditional software engineer is how I started off and then started building products. We always had a sense of whether the product works or doesn't work. And we were only obsessed with this question of whether it was working or not working. But now, that is no longer the criteria by which you should measure AI-powered system. You should actually think, is it working? Is it not working? Under what circumstances can this be used for malevolent intent? What could be its unintended consequences? These are new questions that none of the software engineers are taught to think and none of the teams that work with software engineers are taught to question. These are new checklists that we need to start. And we need to begin to question this. If you look at Twitter and Facebook, it was not the intention of the individuals who created these platforms that they would become such webs of fake data and manipulation of human emotion. And yet, that's exactly what happened. This is the kind of critical thinking that's required at every stage. And in that sense, we have to determine when the human needs to be in the loop. Every single time a decision affects human beings in a significant manner, we have to put humans in the loop. Because if you put them out of the loop, then the system keeps optimizing itself constantly and may end up with something that is not in the interest of the organization or in the interest of the citizens themselves. So what happens when you're thinking about governance? One of the most important things is to be basically familiar with the most simplistic model of modeling. Your data goes in. It's pre-processed. Then you apply some algorithms. And then you choose a candidate model through an iterative approach. And then finally, there's an application. There are 10 different points at which governance needs to be applied, right from the data that is chosen to the way it is transformed and prepared to the actual algorithms that are chosen and to how they're used and protected. Data privacy, data security, all of these are important. That's when you begin to get real results without sacrificing human values. Now, it would be much easier if our models just explained themselves to us. It would be good because then we could validate the fairness, debug the models themselves. We could contest the models. But unfortunately, the reality is that even though 
explainability is badly needed and wanted by us, the more complex the artificial intelligence algorithm, the more difficult it is to explain it in plain words. As a result of this, what happens is that people begin to accept what they're given or they don't take the risk at all. I go to many conferences, I sit on many panels, I have CEOs of multiple companies sit with me and they all make a pledge for explainability and transparency. But here's the kicker, the more you can explain something, the less accurate it is, because it's less complex. And then they all go back to their investors and to Wall Street and they're punished for choosing so-called ethics over better accuracy and optimized operations. So at some point, all of us just need to put our money where our mouth is, including me, and actually continue to stand up for governance and continue to stand up for more transparency and accountability. There's one place where we won't have a choice, and that's in Europe. I like Europe because I feel like it puts a stake in the ground and says that we own our own data and we deserve to know what happens to it, and we deserve to know if any algorithm made a decision that significantly affected our lives. We need to know why. It's a difficult ask given the trade-off that I just explained, but it's a good direction for us to go into. If an AI algorithm said, you, your father's Alzheimer's medication is not approved, or your mortgage is not approved, or your child's college education loan is not approved, and you wanted to know why, it would be impossible for the loan officer to tell you if he was using artificial intelligence. We need better ways of extracting explainability. I still remember one incident at a conference in Singapore when I was sitting with the CEO of an up-and-coming fintech company. And we were talking together, and then a man walked past us. And the gentleman next to me took his phone and recorded him walking past us. And then he said, yeah, I would never give him a loan. And I said, how can you, how would you know that? And he said, well, Aisha, we have created an AI algorithm that has, that can correlate a person's risk worthiness with how he walks. And apparently we are already experimenting with it in a couple of banks to great success. I felt very uncomfortable with that. It's very difficult on many levels. I mean, I don't know how it worked for him, but at some point we have to decide, even if it works, are we comfortable with how that decision came? And these are, again, there are no easy answers. We have to decide together. In Singapore, the government decided, we have so much technology, we want our talent to be able to know that you don't leave values behind when you become a high-tech society. So Singapore is one of the first governments in the world that has a framework for ethical governance of artificial intelligence. And it takes kind of a safety-first approach. There is cybersecurity and data protection laws, but there's also the ethics of algorithms. And a guideline is provided uh, for companies and agencies where to govern what parts of the AI modeling so that you don't have some of the pitfalls that I talked about earlier. And of course, Singapore then went ahead and won an award for being one of the countries that's thinking about this. The European Union is maybe leading, but Asia now, where the majority of people who will be exposed to AI billions of people, AI algorithms that will determine the apps that they use for transport, for financial services, for healthcare, we will begin to see a lot of thought leadership on this as well. Now, transparency and accountability 
are important, but they're not enough. We have seen that you need to communicate because trust is missing now. So while you may have a good governance inside the company, it doesn't matter to the people who are your customers or your citizens. They need to be heard that you understand their problems and you're constantly empathetically communicating with them. These are the three pillars of trust. In the old days, we just did things internally, but didn't feel or compelled to share them as much as we have to now. And this is something, again, that you have to do or people begin to switch from one platform to another. Well, I would like to end with a few slides that talk about the fact that AI is not a spectator sport. You don't have to be an AI engineer such as myself to understand that every team now will have data and AI in it, that you will have to collaborate with somebody who knows it, and that, in fact, multidisciplinary teams are needed. Unfortunately, even though we need more interaction between the humanities and the sciences, what is happening is that they're becoming more dispersed and apart. And we need to stop this trend. We need to shatter the myth that engineering and humanities, that business and social sciences and computer science don't go together. In fact, even as people become more specialized, they need increasingly to learn how to work together. And I think that all of us now are in a team of superheroes. And this team of superheroes actually is made up of each one of us, and it has one new member as well, which is the AI engine. This is very, very important for us to realize that each one of our skills matters, even though it is no longer enough so your domain expertise matters for everyone, and maybe people of your seniority are not, not bothered, but I meet young people all the time who are worried. What is going to happen to our jobs? I spent 10 years in banking. Is it all worth nothing? That is not true. But it is not enough any longer. You need to know how to work with machines. You need to understand the basics so that you can probe its biases. In fact, on our Harvard Business Review article said that we should treat intelligent machines as colleagues. And why did he say colleagues? I really like that term. Because colleagues, we are open to their ideas from the insights that we get from data mining. But we're also critical when colleagues are saying something that instinctively doesn't seem right to us. And we should not remove the emphasis that we put on our instincts and our domain knowledge, even when we encounter AI machines, because they may be biased. They are made by people and teams such as myself and my team. And it is important to continue to refine them, keeping our values at the core of it. In Singapore, it was very important for us to think about the right way to upskill our entire nation. We don't have commodities. We don't have natural resources. What we have is people. And talent is at the top of our list of how to succeed in a world that is inevitably going to be changed by artificial intelligence. So our former deputy prime minister literally told all of us, what if jobs and skills have an expiry date? That doesn't mean what you did is no longer good enough, but you need to keep improving. And here's what I did. I started a charity called 21st Century Girls because I didn't see enough women like me who were talking about artificial intelligence and deep tech in boardrooms. And we took these girls, they're 19 to 21, and they don't have any technical background. And we did a survey and we asked them, how do you feel about artificial intelligence? And they said, we're excited, but you know, we don't think we'll do well in that world because we don't understand it at all. And then in just 10 weeks, three hours every Saturday, 9 to 12 p.m., 
We taught them just the basics of algorithms. We taught them how to link AI solutions with business problems and the ethics of how to judge bias and how to make sure AI is governed properly. And here they are at their graduation, full of excitement, full of confidence. So if they can do it, I truly believe all of us can do it too, no matter what our age or our interest, so that we create a better world for not only our customers, but also ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. It's, governance is, is clear, right? We have to have a way of structuring a format and a framework. And the topic of morality and ethics, it all maps back to can we trust the input? Can we trust the output? Can we trust those who are crafting the mechanics of that? But trust is also a very necessary, well, trust is an output of being empowered. Let's actually roll this back a little bit and talk about how do we empower ourselves, our teams, and certainly our customers so that we can build trust in these micro decision and data driven decision mechanisms that we're setting up. Let's talk about empowerment and where do we start? What are some of those ideas that have been percolating about improving empowerment, especially when choice is a black box. Right, I think this is, this is all about that. This is a great question. So it starts at, uh, in education. Mm. If you're looking at children, a lot of uh, countries are now beginning to teach kids coding, but they're not teaching them the critical thinking that goes with it. It's really not about technique, it's about creative problem solving. A lot of the kids, people that you will hire out of universities, they're not taught about governance, or ethics or critical thinking again. They're literally taught to make something work. It compiles, it works, that's it. So we have to change our very education system. And I'm very against the black box with our clients, with our teams. We spend a lot of time trying to explain logically and simply as much as possible what is going on both in the process and in the algorithm itself. I think we talked earlier this morning, our discussion about the future of money actually came back to there's a mechanic question and there's a moral question. And there's something missing from this discussion because we've gone hog wild and full steam ahead. And we're now having to retrench ourselves and back and kind of go back to first principles of why are we shortcutting these assumptions and why are we structuring it this way? So in talking about that notion of, of education and understanding, we're still having, there's still a dearth of, of conversation around the ethics and morality of how we structure this. Where do you think that should sit? Where do you think that conversation should sit, especially with this in, within this particular industry? Let's go back to the, it's a moral question, it's a philosophical question. Who should be at the table and how should we be discussing this? So the most important thing is that you need to have a diverse team at the table. So the, the tendency seem, is that when you think about the people who are making uh, regulations, they're usually lawyers, uh, but you need not only AI experts, but you also need philosophers in it as well, because really we are rewriting the social contract with citizens. We're going a little bit back to the principles of how society is set up. Um, so I think we need more social sciences to partake in the conversation and we need to listen to them. But the issue often is that the desire for cro corporate profit making comes head to head with more idealistic versions of what should be done. And I think the balance between the two lies that of course private corporations need to make money, but if you put the right governance in place, at least you are trying to avoid some of the pitfalls. Um, you know, when it comes to privacy, for example, if you put in a way that you are anonymizing at source some of the things, then you are already taking away that, uh, that issue that a lot of people worry about. So we know, for example, in Toronto, an entirely new smart city was being built, and when the, by Google, and when the woman who was put in charge of it, it's 12 acres on the waterfront, she said because they were not scrubbing the data at source, but back on Google servers, she resigned and said that was not an ethical way of doing it. 
So I think these are, these are good. We are having these conversations now. Um, and you know, it's difficult for me because I run an AI company. So it, these are moral dilemmas that all of us face uh, as corporations, but we need, we need to have that discussion, basically. I think, I think I'm gonna take this in a little different direction in the sense that when we talk about a global standard, that's a mechanism when we have a common protocol. We don't have a common protocol for the assumptions that we have are building into. I mean, an algorithm is, a, is an assumption. It's a series of assumptions that are, that are kicking off the next step. And there's no global protocol for that because what we want in governance and what we value in terms of the social contract and certainly some of the policies that are being made by government are localized and culturalized. And how do we actually do that at scale across the globe when values, commerciality, ethics, governance, and policy is all localized? And Singapore is experiencing this. They're playing with the model. So I want, I want to get a few insights in how they're experimenting with that, but building it for local, but understanding that this may actually very well inform eventually a global protocol. So what's Singapore doing? Along with that ethics board, what are you seeing come out of that? I think a lot of it is this emphasis on education and including the, the discussion on governance much more broadly. But I also want to point out that you know, Estonia, Singapore, India, China, they're very different, not only because of the fact that um, culturally, but also because of their size. So some things that are a no-brainer in a small country uh, you know, when you go to a larger country and there's a lot of unbanked population, there's a lot of criminal activity, uh, you know, some things are okay if governed properly. Some data acquisition actually leads to better outcomes. And I think that's also important to realize, just as I pointed out, that when these poor people have nothing to go on, no bank will give them in data, but in exchange for their data, they're actually given a loan, it's very hard to argue against it. And I actually started off in human rights and microfinance in villages. So I have seen how women who are under the thumb of their husbands in villages, when they got a little bit of money, how enterprising they were and how it actually encouraged them to teach their daughters and sons and give them more education as well. There is a morality to this in terms, especially of financial inclusion, there's a right. business case for it because it's expanding markets. Yeah. But there is something fundamental about access to being able to have access to financial services, which is just a representation of resource allocation. And for thin file, no file credit, this is an amazing empowerment. At the same time, we can see the other side of the coin and the dangers when we incorporate emergent or technical or social bias and from the data science structuring and the, 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 the curation of it itself, and also the privacy constraints that we need to maybe perhaps put in place because legally it's granted as a human rights now. Thank you very much, GDPR. But I, I want you to leave us with a final thought of what we should be taking away as we start to talk about empowerment, trust, and optimizing material good, but at the same time keeping within a moral and ethical framework, how do we start to think about AI, especially as we go forward? Not just practical application, but 20 years down the road and its implication. It's all about how we control the downside right now. It's a new framework of thinking about it. It's actually going through the process chain and trying to find out where are the vulnerabilities in the system or where are the paths at which you need to make a decision. Because right now what is happening is between the business people and the, um, and the engineers, they don't think they have a choice. So empowerment is giving people the choice to actually stop at critical points and rethink whether it makes sense for them as well. And a lot of companies now, um, you know, they have CSR, they have commitments to sustainability, and I really believe that in the next 20 years we will see a similar commitment to AI governance, privacy, and data security. And those companies that make a commitment to it, their values will ripple through the entire modeling process. 
And that will be very exciting to see. And quite frankly, there's commercial and profitability opportunity there in spades. So, Dr. Khanna, thank you so thank very you. much.